Welcome to Digital Value Creation. This is the channel for my brother and I, because I work for an AI software company. And I work for an AI hardware company. So we look at trends and what we see in the AI space, and the hype and reality. And it's been a while since we posted because we've been super busy. We've been traveling. So let's start recapping that. I think my brother had the craziest experience going to Taiwan and learning things about Kwai Kwai. When you think about Taiwan, sometimes we think about TSMC and all the chip manufacturing that is going on there. A biggest discovery was a different type of chip. A chip that comes in a green bag. It's called Kwai Kwai. And uh, that's a chip that you don't just buy and eat, although you can. But what most people use it for is to make sure that all their systems are performing well. Um, it's one of the most charming, the most interesting discoveries. Because the word Kwai Kwai means, both in Taiwanese and in Mandarin, to obedient, well-behaved. And I think that started a myth, or a reality, who knows, where people start to put these green bags everywhere, in server rooms, in labs. Actually, when Taiwan launched its first satellite, they surrounded it <laughs> with Kwai Kwai chip bags. And uh, one of the gifts I brought home and give it to my friends and family is these bags of Kwai Kwai. So how do you use your Kwai Kwai? It, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, he called me, he came back, he landed, I thought it was jet lag. He said, I have these chips and you put it on electronics and it's gonna make them work better. Fast forward to today, I have Kwai Kwai on my Peloton, my computer, my studio equipment, my lights, my networking hub, and my Verizon Fios connector, everything. And Did you have any outage? I had no outages. <laughs> so it's working. It's science, <laughs> hashtag science. But that's not the end of it. So he posts about his experience and he had all these reactions from all over the world about, well, primarily try one, about people's experience about Kwai Kwai. And we'll attach somewhere here the <laughs> screenshot of what this is all about because you can actually order it. And we got no affiliate fees, it's just <laughs> crazy stuff. And um, I mean, it's amazing the culture and how people embrace a different way of thinking. And for me, it was probably the most charming element of bringing humanity to the highest concentration of brilliance and science and manufacturing together. So it's chips and chips. Chips and chips. So we learned something. I mean, we've been in tech for a long time, <laughs> never knew about a chip that can reduce downtime. So value add right there. So now, you have been in New York in the World Economic Forum strategy session. Did AI come up? Did it ever? <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's, you know, we all live this world. So I think sometimes it's crazy. Everything is AI. And, and maybe we, we thought we live in a bubble. I went to the, uh, the, the uh, Summit for Chief Strategy Officers at the World Economic Forum, and it's every industry. I mean, you could be pouring concrete, or you could be flying an airline. And, and AI, of course, becomes a centerpiece. And partially because people are trying to make sense out of it, like how is this impacting me? But, but also because I think the latest stats we've seen, 70% of people are using generative AI every day in their work. And nobody knows exactly how. Hell, nobody knows how <laughs> Gen AI works. So, so that's there. Uh, so it was really interesting from, from this, in this forum, how much people believe it's actually going to shift corporate strategy. So we're not going to get into the details of corporate strategy, but, but the interesting part is, is how you interact with your customers, how you deploy your workforce, what kind of problems you can solve algorithmically now or, or with AI versus the problems you have to solve with people. Those are big questions companies are trying to determine. And everybody's worried they're falling behind. So there's this fear that we're not moving fast enough. There's also a fear that it costs very a lot of money to actually move fast enough. And how do you balance it? And these are actually very big questions. I mean, you and I were looking at the cost of, uh, 
of generative AI development. Now, most of us are not in actually creating frontier models, but the cost of creating those models are growing exponentially. So the latest was Gemini was the training cost was like 160 million or something like that. Uh, GPT-4 was like 70 million. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the cost is going up and companies are making say, okay, so now we have these models, but using the models costs a lot to, uh, to use. That, that's a key point that it's not just training. Uh, there's a significant cost for us using the model the inference cost. So partially, um, I was very excited. I was up in Seattle for Microsoft Build, and the conversation shifted. It shifted from just uh, what is the biggest model, what is the next generation. GPT-4.0 just launched on the same week uh, Build was held. And it was interesting that the focus was no longer just how big the model is or how capable it is, but that GPT-4.0 actually cost half as much mm -hmm. as GPT-4 costed for inference uh, cost, and it performed twice the speed, basically half the latency, half the cost. And if you go back to the original GPT launch, it's I think one-tenth now the cost of it. And for me, what was a key takeaway from Build is a lot of excitement was not about the frontier models anymore. Yeah, those are important. But it's about some of these smaller models where you have no latency, you have instant response. Some of that maybe you can run on the edge and you get response. Because the question is, do you really need a frontier model for everything? That's my favorite topic. <laughs> <clears throat> do you have a problem big enough for GPT-4 even? It's very interesting, like the, the kind of things people do, like you know, create a recipe or <clears throat> you know, recommend a packing list for me or write this letter for me, you can actually do it with GPT 3.5 for sure, maybe three, I never use three. <clears throat> so I think we're at a point, even at the frontier model side, like we, we don't have a big enough problem to solve. Now you could argue that multimodal is interesting, yeah. but do you really have, do you have to have, do you have to create a video? Is this part of your workflow? I mean, do you, do you really have to? So, so most of us don't have a problem on the consumer side. Now on the business side, the problem is the opposite, is do you have the budget to solve a big enough problem? Because I mean, this is the other thing we see that um, as we started to prepare for our AI day, and I'll touch a little bit about discoveries there, we reached out to a lot of companies that where are they in their adoption? And as, as you said, 70% of the people use Gen AI tools at work in some shape or form. But when we dig deeper, what we discover that 90% of them are still in the experimentation phase. If you remember our 4E framework, most companies did not get up to scaling or really drive effectiveness. And uh, Part of it is because we are right now fascinated, we see and solve problems, we have great proof, uh, proof points, those are fantastic. But then, when you start to scale that up, that's when token costs start to kick in. That's when inference costs start to kick in. So companies start to realize that as they go from experimentation to scaling up to effectiveness, you need to look at the total cost uh, of inference, and if you did any fine tuning, or even training because your industry requires something very unique, the cost can add up very, very quickly. And I'm yet to see use cases where the ROI is super strong. I think the ROI is really good to start the journey. And a lot of times the ROI have a lot of promise, but the total cost of inference and tuning is yet to be factored in. You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> I had a chance to attend uh, the AI Summit. One of the presenters talked about this, like, is generative AI the next metaverse, the next <laughs> blockchain? Are we just trying to, you're, I mean, you, we all remember when this tea company, I think in Texas where we are, <laughs> renamed itself as a blockchain tea, tea company and that, that increased their valuation. So are we still in the hype stage? And some people believe we're super hyped in, in, in Gen AI. Some people believe this is the worst AI we've ever used in our life. And I actually tend to believe that. But, but, it's, but it's an interesting question because on one hand, we all fear like we're falling behind. On the other hand, people are saying, I, I really don't know what problem I need to solve. And businesses are the same way too. Um, but it was, but I, I think the event itself, what, what, what you guys hosted, was very important because 
you have to have more and more like hundreds if not thousands of people thinking about this in a large company saying what am i using ai for what is the what is the possibility and, and let's get practical about it and um, there was a study i think you showed me where companies that that have as many people as many employees as possible think about ai using ai actually solve a lot bigger problems. In, in most cases, if, if it's really an IT team or engineering team, mm -hmm. then they're solving engineering problems. If, but if the rest of the company is involved, you can actually solve bigger problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And fascinating data point that right now, less than 10% of the companies reach the point where one quarter of their workforce is fluent or trained in Gen AI tools and techniques. And that really limits what problems are solvable. I mean, there are the obvious one in customer service, marketing, some of the content creation, some of the IT problems. But uh, the study that you referred to showed that when the company goes beyond just experimentation and really develop understanding and train the workforce and invest in workforce training, this is when they can go beyond that and go to legal, supply chain, some of the product development problems as well. And uh, for me, that also posed the question, and the main reason we created our summit is to up-level our knowledge, to kind of challenge the team to think beyond the day-to-day. -day. I mean, both of us challenged our kids last December to get prompt engineering certification, because actually, last year, that was still a job. That was a high six-figure job. It's like, you can make two, three hundred thousand dollars that were actually postings. You don't find those anymore. I mean, the game changed completely. It went from a job to, you know how to use it. The same as like, you know how to use the keyboard, you have to use the mouse. You know how to, you need to know how to interact with these tools. It's, it became a requirement, <laughs> table stakes. So yeah. nowadays, uh, the other data point we looked at is, you cannot get a job yeah. it, unless you have some baseline AI skills. And that wasn't like that a year ago. A year ago, you could get a really good job. <laughs> now it's like a different different uh, place. And uh, and and I think this we on this channel, we don't talk about the fear side of AI because we were very optimistic. Uh, Reality is, though, uh, we had one of the presenters uh, uh, who's, uh, who's a professor, an MBA professor uh, at, a, at a major business school said, one of the top 20 jobs that could be replaced completely with AI is his job. Yeah. A professor <laughs> at back on a, or a business uh, at, at a major business school. So if he wasn't worried, but, but this, it's, it's an important fact. If he looks at all the things he does, he grades paper, he assigns, you know, creates a, a, a schedule for, for study, you know, presents uh, content. I mean, all those elements, if you take it apart, can be replaced and maybe all of us have to keep up skilling. And, and it, it's very, I mean, it's, since we post this on LinkedIn, uh, it's a very common question we get back uh, from people we know. It's like, how do I get ahead? Like, how do I stay ahead? Like, I learned prompt engineering, <laughs> now, but now that's useless. And, you know, did uh, I make a to mistake? To be fair, it's still useful, but now it's a job requirement. I mean, uh, the recent Wall Street Journal article highlighted that if you live in a Bay Area, again, it's not universal yet, but if you live in a Bay Area and you have a coding job and you don't have AI skill, you might have a really hard time to, to find a job or, or you will not be compensated at the level you wanted. And yeah, it's easy to dismiss that, oh, well, AI is not great at everything I do. It's true, but what we do has 10, 15, 20 elements. And today, AI yeah, might be good at five or 10 of those, but it increases quickly. And those who leverage AI will get ahead. It's, it's one of the biggest leveler of the playing field. And actually, it's an interesting point. Uh, I think the more we think about this space, maybe this is gonna be a deep statement here, uh, <laughs> you cannot be average. So whatever, we all have to pick, like I'm gonna get really good at something and whatever I'm gonna get good at will be augmented with AI. All of us, we do our jobs with augmented AI. You cannot be average in this because the biggest learning we had and one of the, one of, uh, um, the, uh, the people we follow in this space is Ethan Malik and he wrote, wrote about this uh, research they've yeah. done on, uh, with BCG uh, on t taking a look at the average or, or beginner analysts and how much they can upskill them. So they're going to outperform the average 
analysts without AI. So we're all going to be in these situations. We pick, a, pick an area of expertise and we really have to get deep. We have to use all the tools and they keep changing. There's no prescription. We can't give you one because <laughs> it's going to change. Uh, but I think that's the learning. That's how we, we learn like every week. You set aside some time. It's like I need to get ahead in the area I pick and whatever area that is for you, that's what we do. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, there's no end in sight because this whole area is shifting and shifting to all the players. Yeah, and we will include some of those resources. But for me, the biggest takeaway was AI is phenomenal when you start something new, when you need to get into a field and it really levels the playing field. You can get up to speed a lot quicker than you used to do that. I mean, I was fascinated how sometimes like Microsoft and Khan Academy just announced a collaboration to help kids to have tutors in more than 100 countries. And, but the same applies for us professionals. So when we need to pivot, when we need to take on a new assignments, and we need to go deep quickly, AI is phenomenal. AI is also very helpful when you are already an expert and you want to accelerate your impact, but you can supervise it. But AI seems to struggle, uh, struggle right now. It's kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. When you know something, you expect it to deliver a high quality output, but you don't know enough to supervise it. For me, that's the danger zone. So what I find most of the value, and when I talk to my team, that, that's their feedback as well. When I talk to my peers, very similar, that when you want to help somebody to get into something, great help. When somebody is already an expert and you want to accelerate their output, great help. In the middle, make sure that there is some human supervision. Yeah. Well, I want to change the topics because uh, change the subject to two other things. Uh, because it's interesting what's happening in the non-career side, not the learning <laughs> side of things. Uh, one is not getting too deep, but, but it's really interesting the whole um, arms race has been around building bigger and bigger models. Mm -hmm. And and now we're seeing a series of announcements. You mentioned the uh, SA, uh, the Microsoft build and, and their, their Model 5. So it's a much lighter, even though Microsoft is an investor in OpenAI, they're actually coming up with the very lightweight models. We're seeing the same thing happen across the open source space, very small models. We're, when we're recording this, <laughs> Apple is about to come out with a light model. Hopefully this is gonna work. Siri on AI will work. Uh, but that's the new trend, and, and why this is exciting, because going back to the earlier point, AI is gonna get accessible to a billion people, two billion people. So, so far, we, where we're recording in the US, we are privileged to have access to really high-end models, okay. but they may not be needed for all the things we're talking about. So this, this going smaller model, it's not just a, a technical um, angle, it's really important for, for jobs and careers and, and the road ahead. And also, if you look at the large models, it's not just the token cost. It's about the energy cost. I mean, right now when we execute all these large models on, on a cloud, yes, some of these models are subsidized and a monthly uh, subscription fee, I'm not even covering it, and luckily for many people, these models are available for free as well. But this is not sustainable. So be, having, having the ability to run these models on the edge, on edge, edge devices, is gonna be critical. What that means that these models need to get smaller. And I think this is the latest breakthrough in the last couple of months. A lot of research came up that it's no longer about how big is the model is and how many trillion model, how many different mixture of experts you bring in. But sometimes overtraining some of these small models, drive to performance that matches or exceed order of magnitude higher models. And some of those overtrained small models can run on the edge, whether it's in a car whether it's in a phone, whether it's in a laptop. We'll, we'll all use it soon. Yeah. I can't wait. Apple. Uh, <laughs> but overtraining is an important other aspect. So one of the weirdest things, I think, around AI is, well, two things that I can think of. One is none of us really know how it works. <laughs> uh, but the second is every time there's a mistake, and the latest when we're recording it is Google search, <laughs> You know, didn't work well um, with with AI search, but our tolerance level to mistakes by machines is much lower than mistakes by humans, which is really interesting. Which is good for humans. <laughs> Go humans. And actually, it's not just it's lower; it's strange. Because on one hand, 
We trust machines more than we trust humans. Like, and we are all in the technology field. So we implemented solutions that solve real problem. And a lot of times we know humans make a mistake, therefore we implement these systems so they don't. And we usually take a, a number from a system saying that it's coming from a system, it's reliable, we trust it. Because most traditional IT systems are deterministic. They are algorithm driven, they are verifiable. Gen AI is not. That's the power of it. <laughs> it's, it's somewhat stochastic, it's probabilistic. Uh, but that leads to a very interesting spot where in normal IT system, we trust them, but the moment they make a mistake, we just want to disengage completely. If a human makes a mistake, we say that, you know what, it's human. When a machine makes a mistake, it's broken. Well, I cannot trust it anymore. I cannot run a business. And with Gen AI solution, they will make a mistake. That's part of the design. So the question is, how can we pick use cases that are more fault tolerant? Yeah, it's interesting. There's this whole big word, if I can pronounce it, interpretability. <laughs> um, so, so if you have a look in this space, it's quite interesting. There are scientific papers coming out like, we think this is how it works, especially with small models. Nobody knows how the big models work, uh, how they actually think in their uh, brain neural networks. Um, and, and it's interesting because when we get tired, we were joking around. It's like we have moments when we don't know what the next token we're going to say is going to be. And it happens here on this channel as well. But that's sort of how these models work. So as much as, so there's some magic and mystery. So we all use this, at least those of us who use these models all the time. We use this, like we trust it. We create content that we wouldn't normally generate. We create meeting notes and plans and everything else. But it's a model that really doesn't know what it's going to say the next moment. And I'm just talking about the language models and not talking about the, uh, uh, the image models. So it's important to understand that there is always risk. And, and as you talked about fine tuning, so as, it, as, as the models get better tuned, maybe the, it's going to be more predictable. Uh, but we're shifting a lot of trust to systems that we can't explain. So we just leave it there. It is a fact. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think it's fundamentally different, though, from all other IT systems we yeah. used to have. Because you can debug it. Like, something I did, it, I, it was supposed to do this, and it didn't. You could figure out why not. Here, not sure. Not really. And because of that, I mean, there's compensating controls. We can put some guardrails, we can put rag and ground the model, but even the rag grounded model, you don't know how well tuned the search engine was in the first place. So did it really ground the model in the right information? And when the information surfaced, uh, was, was the search comprehensive enough? Did you put enough data in? Uh, did you really summarize the right area? Did you chunk it right at the front end? So there is a lot of research and a lot of focus going on to improve the quality of these models, but there will always be a gap. It's interesting. Uh, so we all, so we have some suggestions. Yeah. You can find your own. Um, uh, in terms of when you have to, and, and if you ask college students, yeah. like my daughters, they'll, they'll tell you. So when you have to do things fact-based, you have to find tools that actually generate content fact-based. Our, our favorite is Perplexity because it's a tool that will primarily use verified content. But then when you need the creative part, you're going to end up with large language models like GPT or Gemini. Um, and, and I think you need to be thoughtful about this. So depending on the content I'm generating, how do I sequence it? So maybe you need to interact with multiple models. So it's a, it's a big topic. Maybe you should spend time on this in the future. But creating your own workflow so you trust your workflow is important because nobody it's not going to come out of the box as a trusted system. So you have to say, I tested it. I use it in my daily work. And it seems to work. I, I, I trust it. So that will be our learning, your learning, is my belief. And, um, and to build on that, be pragmatic about where you use the model. If it's an area where you just want to create options, then that's great. These models are fantastic at it. And that's where validation and grounding is not as critical. If your aim is to create an outcome that is valid and you want to make actions or decisions on, then choose a field where maybe you're an expert on, so you can be the human in loop, or leverage someone who, who can validate that those results are reasonable and have a sounding board. You still compress the time it takes to solve a problem, but you have a validated results. 
So we'll, we'll, there's a lot of feedback. We're gonna keep coming back to this topic of learning and, and what works. Maybe we'll dive into the workflow a little bit more. Um, so for date sessions, this is what we thought about. Um, hint, my brother composed a quite quite song. So we're gonna end with that uh, today. And um, I mean, to be fair, I don't have these powers. You know, we, in our AI day, we had some artists who had a very strong passion about the fact that we can be creative with AI. Does that mean that we should be? Well, I'm in a camp that if AI has tools that enable us to do things we never did before, we should. So I used actually Udio to compose the song. My brother composed a song <laughs> <laughs> about Kwai Kwai, and I hope it's going to protect all your electronics and our ours. And that is probably all we had today. Thank you. Super happy that we finally, not just find a way to come back to the channel, but do it together right here in Austin. Hopefully we'll do more of this live. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Keep safe. Keep your electronics running with Kwai Kwai. In Taiwan, there's a charm, not a fairy or a gnome. It's a green bag of snacks in tech rooms. It roams Kwai Kwai on the desk next to screens that glow. Whispering to the machines, keep the errors low. Kwai Kwai, stay by my side. In your green bag, my hopes reside. Keep my...